Now, we live in an amazing time. Uh, scientifically, the scientific advances are quite amazing. Uh, even reading some of the stories about uh, how they've uh, come up with a vaccine, even though it's been rushed and all that, and there's different uh, opinions on the safety of it and that kind of thing. But just the technology behind some of this is, is just amazing to think about. Think about some of the medical, uh, some of the machines that can examine us. Uh, you may consider, first of all, the ultrasound. Many of you probably had an ultrasound. Any of you ladies who've been pregnant, that's a pretty common thing. An ultrasound is basically, it uses sound waves to produce images of organs, vessels, and tissues. Just sound waves reflecting back. Uh, many of you have had X-rays, you ever had a broken bone or wondered about that? You've had an X-ray. Basically, these X-rays are sent through the body and a camera on the other side of the patient records the pattern of the X-rays that hit, that hit it. And as, it, as the X-rays travel through the body, uh, it, the more dense uh, things like bones absorbs the X-rays and the skin lets the X-ray pass through. And so they're, they're left with an image of uh, what it looks like, at least the denser tissues and bones and things. But that's kind of old technology. They came out later with uh, computed tomography, or the CT scan as we know it. It's a sophisticated, sophisticated diagnostic imaging uh, procedure capable of depicting anatomical uh, the anatomy at different levels within the body. This ability is known for cross-sectional imaging. And it's possible because the x-ray source rotates around the patient during the scan, encircling the patient's body and capturing uh, anatomical detail from many angles. So we're able to see kind of a 3D picture of what, what's happening inside our bodies. And there's what's called the positron emission tomography. This is what we call it the PET scan. And it's an effective way to measure the amount of, sci of physiological activity in different parts of the body. The PET scan shows metabolism and other physical processes. Metabolism is when your body burns fuel, such as sugar, to make energy. And cancerous tissue, for example, needs more energy than normal tissues. And it measures the in energy being burned, and typically cancer will show up as a bright spot on the PET scan. Amazing, amazing technology. We also have, have mag magnetic resonance imaging, the MRI, which again is a sophisticated diagnostic technique that uses a magnetic field, uses radio waves and a computer to generate a detailed cross-section of images of the human body. Um, it, because it produces better soft tissue images than x-rays can, the MRI is commonly used to, to image the brain, the spine, the thorax, and the vascular system. It's interesting that the magnetic field is, that it uses is, is up to 8,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And so some of these things are, are quite amazing. Uh, even, they even have nuclear uh, nuclear medicine, where they put radioactive stuff inside your body. Not highly radioactive, but somewhat, and they're able to see where it goes and, for example, see how it processes through your kidneys and capture those images of what's going on in there. It's amazing the advances when it comes to examining our bodies. What works? What's not working very well? We live in a, an amazing time. But if you think about it, there really is no technology for evaluating our spiritual condition. We have amazing technology for our physical condition, but there really is nothing, there's no scan that can be done to tell us our spiritual condition. But we do have spiritual tools. We have scriptural principles that we can use to see what's going well, and what's not going so well in our spiritual lives. And of course, as we approach the Passover, we are encouraged to examine ourselves if you would turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> we'll read there. Today I'd like to talk about examining ourselves spiritually, um, why we do it, how we do it. <clears throat> Basically, the fundamental reason as to why, why we do it is to show respect to the sacrifice of Christ and to make sure that we partake of the Passover in a worthy manner. Now, worthy doesn't mean we're sinless, of course, but it means that we have examined ourselves and taken some steps that we'll go through today to make sure that we're ready for the Passover itself. We know from Romans 3.23 3, that all have sinned 
We all have. Since last Passover, we all have. It also says we, have, we fall short of the glory of God. And we will always fall short of the glory of God until Christ's return, won't we? Uh, God will always be more glorious than us uh, in attitude, in being, and in every way. But because we fall short, we desire to measure up, to better measure up to God, to become more like our elder brother Jesus Christ, to more like uh, a son or daughter of God, a child of God should be. So let's pick up the context of this instruction in 1 Corinthians 11. We'll start reading in verse 17 because we find that Paul is dealing with a church at Corinth that is it's not very healthy spiritually. In fact, it needs a lot of help. At the, at the end, he tells us that he's going to be coming to visit them and he'll set things more in order. He'll give them more instruction than what he gives here. But he gives some very direct instruction about them uh, considering their condition. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17 now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for better, but for worse. Their coming together was producing bad fruit. Uh, for First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. When there is sin uh, in any group of God's people, it will, it will cause division. Because it's natural. That's, it's Satan's way. He will use sin to divide us. We live in a world today, in fact, that's so divided because of the pandemic. And there are so many different truths out there. You know, what do you believe? Who do you listen to? Everybody can, in a very realistic way, we can have varying opinions on things. And sometimes we have to be very careful not to bring that division, you know, Division over physical things, worldly things, uh, into the church. And to remember that we are Christ's body. We are to be unified. And there are so many things that, that we could get into that's very ununifying, very disunifying, but we try to avoid that. The Corinthian church had sin amongst them. And it was causing problems. So Paul addresses this. Notice in verse uh, 20. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. No, we don't have a dinner. We don't have a Seder meal. We don't come together and eat. We observe the Passover as Christ did. He did it. He instituted the Passover after supper. And it was a special ceremony in which we partake of his body and his blood. But he said, you don't come to eat the Lord's Supper, uh, which is evidently what they were trying to do. He said, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And um, one is hungry. The other is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you, do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So they were very selfish in their ways. They weren't considering one another. Uh, some actually drunk. Can you imagine that? Uh, to have that kind of attitude toward this occasion. Verse 23 goes on to say, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. And we know that the, the Apostle Paul received from instruction from Jesus Christ himself. Uh, much later, of course, he was not converted at the time. He was not one of the original disciples and the original apostles. But he came along later, and Christ taught him personally. And he says, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, the Lord, uh, th that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now notice, so we are, we are partaking of this bread and this wine as a, as a symbol of Christ's body and his blood. It should be a very sobering occasion. And over the years, our tradition within the Church of God has been that. We come, we don't really fellowship as we normally do. We sit, we read the Bible, we contemplate what we're about to do. And it is a very sobering, in a very good way, 
You know, we can be thankful for that sacrifice. We can um, recognize and think about what Christ went through on this occasion. And it is very sobering. But they weren't taking it that way at the time. And he says, uh, that I received from Christ uh, what I, I'm delivering to you. Notice he says, the same night in which he was betrayed. He's making the point that it, this is the, the when. This is when we do it. You know, there are sometimes, there's always... Uh, Arguments that are going around saying we should do it as the Jews do it, and the Jews changed the way they did it over the years to make, to make it a temple ceremony, and the only way, way they could kill all the lambs in the temple was to delay the eating of it until the end of the 14th. And so they do it a little differently than we do. But Christ did it at the very beginning, that night, the same night in which he was betrayed, before he went out uh, to be betrayed and to be arrested, he partook of those symbols. And verse 26 then, for as often as you eat, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so we do it on the same night that he did. When we proclaim his death, we recognize that death. And we will do that until the very time that Jesus Christ returns to the earth. <clears throat> Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, we're, we're guilty of sin, but to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord is to be guilty of defiling that very sacrifice. And we certainly don't want to be in that place. We don't want to partake in an unworthy manner. Notice he gives the prescription here, uh, how we can partake of it in a worthy manner. He says, but let a man examine himself. And so we focus on this oftentimes with more emphasis uh, as we approach Passover. We should examine ourselves always, of course. But we do this with particular zeal as we approach Passover, as we're recommitting ourselves to that covenant that we made uh, with God at baptism. It says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we want to make sure that we discern that body, that sacrifice. We discern its meaning in our lives, how tremendous it was for God the Father to give his son, for Jesus Christ to not only die for us, but to suffer exceedingly and to die so that our sins could be put upon him. We have to discern uh, what that sacrifice means. And it's very important, especially as we approach Passover. It says in verse 30, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastised by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. You know, if we judge ourselves, if we examine ourselves, and if we grow and improve, then God doesn't have to pass judgment. He doesn't have to judge us or, or chastise us. Evidently, as Paul says, many were weak and sick, and that was a result of the fact that they were not respecting the sacrifice of Christ. And so it had physical implications. A spiritual issue here had physical implications <clears throat> and consequences. Notice in verse uh, 33, Therefore, uh, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. So he had more instructions for them, but he wanted them to know this right now. Uh, do this. He wasn't pleased with them. They were being selfish. They were being worldly. They weren't discerning the sacrifice of Christ. <clears throat> we, we, we will take of the Passover, brethren, in a worthy manner when we examine ourselves. We examine our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. Uh, we, are, we are to ask ourselves some searching questions as we approach Passover about what we think and what we do, about our relationship with God. How is that? Have we grown since last year? Why do we, why do we partake, why do we examine ourselves before we partake of the Passover? As I said, it's to show reverence and honor for the body of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, and what he did to free us from the penalty of sin. Why do we do it? So that we may judge ourselves. We judge ourselves. What have we been doing well? What have we doing, been doing better? We can thank God, give him the glory for that. Where, do we, where have we sinned? Where do we need to repent? That's part of how we judge ourselves. Why do we do uh, the examination? Well, so we can, uh, we can be in the kingdom of God ultimately. 
and be in his kingdom. We can grow and become more and more like our elder brother, Jesus Christ. So it's important to consider why we're doing the self-examination to truly, to truly, truly be motivated to do that as we approach this, this time, the spring holy days. So as we go on, I'd like to give you seven steps toward an effective self-examination. Seven steps toward effective self-examination. And I want us to really think about each of these. The first one, perhaps we did when we were first converted, but we continue to do so as we go through our lives. Let's go over to Psalm chapter 25. Psalm 25 and verse 4 and 5. Psalm 25 and verse 4 and 5. It says here in Psalm 25, beginning verse 4, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. This is a prayer that we can pray to God. Show me your ways. Teach me your paths. In verse 5, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a passage that shows how much we must rely on God to show us his ways. So the first point here is ask God to give us a greater understanding of his ways. Of course, when we were first converted and come to know the truth, we begin understanding some of the things we're doing wrong. We have to change. Giving up the pagan holidays, understanding the Sabbath is to be kept but, you know, as we go through our Christian lives, there's so much more understanding that, that is there. And that we can ask God to show us more about his ways of life. Even some of the smaller, more intricate things. So that's the first point. We have to be humble, willing to follow, and teachable in order to truly and sincerely ask this prayer for God to show us his ways. Second point we find in, in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 27. Psalm 119, and verse 27. It says, Make me to understand the way of your precepts, so I shall meditate on your wondrous works. As we, as we pray the prayer, asking God to give us more understanding, teach us his ways, we need to meditate on those lessons, to really think about how it applies to our lives. This is something that's becoming harder and harder to do. You know, if we ask God to show us, give us a greater understanding of his ways, then we have to think about how do I apply that in my life. This kind of meditation takes time. It's quiet time, you might say. Undisturbed time where we can really think about God's way and how we're doing how we can apply it, whether we're applying it. And we live in a world with so many distractions. More and more, we find entertainment so easily accessible. You can binge watch your favorite shows uh, every hour of the day. When you, don't, when you have a day off, you can spend a whole day just binge watching. And there's nothing wrong with that, I guess. But, but to take that time to, to be the kind, have the, the self-discipline that we need to take the time to go to a quiet place and to really think about. Go there with a Bible and maybe our journal or notebook and that we're keeping if you do that. And really think about how you can apply God's ways better in your life. That's a very important step. And it's very easy to get so distracted with so much that we don't do that before Passover. But we really need that time to, to meditate and think about God's ways, his truth, uh, the example of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Jesus Christ and how they can apply uh, more, more in our lives. Point number three. Point number three is consider how are we measuring up to these things. You know, God shows us his ways. We think about our own lives and how we can apply these things. But we have to consider how are we measuring up. How are we doing spiritually? What are we doing that's better, as I said, than last year? And it's important to, to acknowledge where we've grown. And that we can give God glory for working in us, helping us to overcome in certain areas. And we can be specific here, not just general. It's very easy to say, well, God, I know you've helped me grow since last Passover. And I know I still have some things to work on. Please forgive me for that. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful attitude. It's a wonderful sentiment. But it's so general that it's ineffective because we don't really identify those things. 
We need to be specific in considering how we're, we're measuring up. Where are we falling short? Where are we doing well? Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's very easy to fall into this way of thinking that it talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm sorry, 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. <clears throat> where it says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those, <clears throat> with those who uh, commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You know, we're not to just say, well, I, I, I'm doing better than a lot of people I know. You know I, I'm certainly a lot better than the world and some of these people in the world, so you know, I'm sure that uh, that's speaking something good. Well, certainly good, we're better than the world, but we're still, we still have a ways to go. And when we compare ourselves with each other, that's not the measure that we're to use. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I think we're all familiar with, with the verses there. Give us our standard. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. We don't compare ourselves with one another. We don't compare ourselves with the world. It says in, first, in Ephesians 4 and verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. This word perfect means mature, that we're growing every year. We're maturing it says, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, what a, what a phrase, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How are we doing? That's our measurement. And we shouldn't be discouraged because we don't, we're not as tall as Christ, you might say. We're always going to be shorter. We're always going to have something more to, to, to do to become more like him. But that should be a positive thing. How wonderful it is that we can become more godly. What a wonderful thing that we have, because of God's help, the capacity to become more and more like God. There's no greater thing in the world. You know, we might grow in our knowledge, in our careers, and advance in the company we work for, and that's all good. But to be, be able to grow, to become more like God, there's nothing that compares to that. And we don't have to be discouraged thinking, oh, I can never... I can never do it because God, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, God has given us the capacity and the power to do that. We don't do it on our own, and we'll talk more about that. But what a blessing that we have the, the ability, we've been called to grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So how are we doing? How are we doing? We have to think about that prior, uh, prior to Passover and be specific, as I said. How are we doing in this area, that area? Uh, how much are we growing in our, our ability to serve others? How much are we overcoming the natural selfishness that all humans have? Uh, we need to examine specifics in our lives. How are we doing? And point number four, point number four going on. Ask, us, ask God to show us what we can't see. Because there's so much that we don't see about ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? As Jeremiah says. Well, God knows it, and he's able to help us. He's able to see things we can't see. Sometimes we have blinders on, uh, perhaps not even willfully or willingly. It's just, it's just there. And sometimes our friends and family can see things that we, we miss in ourselves. That's why it can be very helpful to talk to your spouse, to talk to friends, and, and see if there's anything that's kind of glaring <laughs> to everybody else, but I'm not seeing it. Uh, maybe it's something that, uh, that you're just, just blind to, you're just not recognizing. Because we see things through our own motives, through our own lens. And sometimes if our motive, if we think our motive is good, then we may discount our actions, which are affecting other people. So ask God to show us what we cannot see. Let's go back to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We'll begin reading verse 1. Psalm 139. 
It says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. God knows us. He does, he does search us. God's not a God that just exists in the far recesses of the universe somewhere. And the world just turns and he kind of takes a step back. He searches us. We know from other passages he knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows us very well. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me and know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. God knows what we're thinking, how we think. It says, you comprehend my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. And, and, and there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Even if we have something we want to say, but we don't let it out, God knows what we were going to say. And so God knows us very deeply. Let's go back, back down to verse 23. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me or, or test me and know my anxieties. What are our worries? What are our concerns? Uh, he's asking God to, to know these things. It says, see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's asking God to, to examine to sh and to examine our hearts and asking God to lead us in a way that we can overcome these things, that we can recognize them because God sees them. And I ask God to show them to us. A very important aspect here. Let's go back a few pages to Psalm 26. Psalm 26 and verse 1. Speaking of a similar thing, it says, uh, Psalm 26, verse 1. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. What am I thinking? What are my motives? Uh, examine me and try me and, and know me. And so we can ask this prayer and we can understand that God is merciful. Thankfully, he doesn't show us everything about ourselves. I mentioned that as people are counseling for baptism. We want to ask God to show us more about ourselves. But thankfully, he doesn't dump everything on us at once because it could be so very discouraging. He gives us what he knows will help us. But we have to be willing to pray that prayer. Show me, God. Examine me. Help me to know where I need to, to change and grow. That's point number four. Ask God to show us what we cannot see. Point number five, very important before Passover. Again, that we don't just generally acknowledge that we're, we don't measure up. We're sinners. Thank you, God, for your sacrifice. We don't just generally acknowledge that. Point number five is to acknowledge and repent of our specific sins and shortcomings. Acknowledge and repent of our specific sins and shortcomings. We ask God for forgiveness, not in a general way, but as much as we can in a very specific way. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 32, and verse 5. Psalm 32 and verse 5. <clears throat> Psalm 32, verse 5 says, I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Notice that it takes actual uh, acknowledging our sin. In one sense, acknowledging to ourselves that we have a problem, that we, we don't measure up. We have to be willing to acknowledge it to ourselves. But we also have to be willing to take it to God. To take it to God. In fact, if you turn back to Leviticus chapter 5, it's interesting that even in the Old Testament, when, when uh, offerings were made for the guilt of, of committing sin, one of the things that they were asked to do was to acknowledge that sin. In Leviticus 5 and verse 5, And it shall be when he is guilty of any of these matters, he shall confess that he has sinned in this thing. There's a very specific confession that was made. It says, And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for the sin which he has committed, a female of the flock, a, a lamb, or a kid from the goats as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him uh, covering, uh, uh, concerning his sin. And so not only did they bring that sin offering, but they had to confess their sin. Very specific. And so that's something that we must do too. It's sometimes it, it can be difficult to confess. Sometimes it's difficult to even acknowledge. Sometimes we'd rather see ourselves better than we may be. 
But again, we have the ability to, to acknowledge and confess, and that is a part of repentance. Uh, if we go back to Romans chapter 2, verse 4, I cover this when I do baptism counseling as well. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> we can't really repent without God's help. We have to consider praying for God to lead us to repentance. Romans 2, verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? That's a very, a very deep verse. What is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance? Well, first of all, you mentioned some of these things, his goodness, his forbearance, his, long, his patience with us. He's very patient with us, his forbearance. And all these things should lead us to repentance. But it's God who leads us. And so we should pray that God would lead us to a truly repentant attitude, a truly repentant I think a, a true spiritual repentance is beyond our mere human capacity. We can feel sorry for something for different reasons. We can feel sorry we got caught. We can feel sorry that, that some other people found out something about us. We can also feel sorry that we didn't measure up to our potential. You know, sometimes we let ourselves down. We, uh, I'm better than that. That's kind of a self-righteous sorrow when we think, well, I'm better than that. I shouldn't have done it because I'm better than that. Uh, it's not about us. It's not about disappointing ourselves. It's about the fact that we've sinned against God. And that's a whole different kind of repentance. And so I ask God to lead you to a deep, heartfelt, true, and spiritual repentance. It's part of uh, what we must do before Passover. And point number six, then, after the idea of repenting specifically of our sins, asking God even to cover the things that we, we don't know about. We don't know everything about ourselves and every way that we sin and fall short, but we, we know many of them. We just ask God to, to forgive us even of those things which we're unaware of quite yet. Asking forgiveness and confessing our sins is very important. It's point number five. Point number six, then, we don't just feel bad about our sin. We don't, we don't just repent. That's a very important uh, thing to do. But we, we overcome. We strive against sin. And when we partake of that bread and wine at Passover, we are recommitting ourselves to, to that dedication to strive against sin, to overcome our sins. We've confessed them. We've acknowledged them. We've repented of them, we, which includes a, a, a guilt, a feeling of guilt, uh, that we've committed these things. But as you know, true repentance also involves the concept of changing direction. When the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, it says they repented. The Hebrew word is they repented. It doesn't mean they repented of their spiritual problems, but it means they turned to go a, a different direction as they were leaving. But the Hebrew word is they repented. It means they turned and they headed a different way. We have to turn as well. Let's go back to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 verse 1, familiar scripture to us. As we strive against sin, as we strive to overcome, consider, consider what, what Christ did, his response, what he did to strive against sin. We'll read that in just a second. But Romans 4, I'm sorry, Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How much do we think about ourselves as a living sacrifice? We sacrifice because of what God has done for us, because of who God is. We sacrifice. We give of ourselves. It says we are a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, considering everything that God has done for us, it is our reasonable and rational service that we would, we would be holy, acceptable to God. We would be a living sacrifice. How much do we see ourselves in that capacity? Putting ourselves aside and doing God's will of overcoming and changing. It says in verse 2, and do not, do not be conformed to this world. So easy to be conformed, to do things and think things the way of the world. It says, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's an encouraging verse for us because we can be transformed. It's possible. But are we striving for that? Are we striving? Do we just repent of our sins and then expect that next year we'll have to repent of the same things? 
I hope not. I hope that we recognize that we can strive against sin. Notice back in Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, we see Christ's example. And it should motivate and inspire us as well. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, verse 3 and 4. Hebrews 12, verse 3 and 4. For, I, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And what did Christ go through for us? Uh, and when we think about that, how, how he endured such hostility, even when we're being bombarded, even when we feel overwhelmed, we can look to what he went through and we can, we can be encouraged. It says in verse 4, you have, not, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Wow, I mean, think about the, the word picture there. To strive against sin to the point of being willing to bleed, to overcome. Christ bled for our sins. And he didn't deserve it. Of all people, of all individuals in the universe, the one who gave us life, who created all things, he didn't deserve that. But he did it for us. And in doing so, he set an example. He never sinned. He was tempted in all points. And, and we truly have to understand he was tempted. But he didn't. He kept himself from it. How much do we strive against sin? That's part of, of what we're committing ourselves to when we partake of that bread and wine. It's to not just accept the sin. Not just try to get a little better. But really try to... Uh, to change directions in every way. <clears throat> We're told in Revelation 8, 4, to come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. There is a chastisement that will come our way if we don't overcome. If God has to bring to our attention certain things because we haven't judged ourselves, uh, we certainly don't want to fall under that kind of judgment from God. He is merciful. He is willing to forgive, but we must be willing to acknowledge and strive against sin. Thankfully, uh, we have help. And that's point number seven. Point number seven, ask God to empower us to overcome. Ask God to empower us. Now, there are some sins that are particularly difficult to overcome, and everyone's different. Every one of us are different. We, there are some sins that are particularly difficult to overcome, and we desperately need God's help. And we need to pray to God and ask him, plead with him to provide us that help. It doesn't mean that we're not striving. We're putting forth our effort. We're changing circumstances in our lives so that we don't repeat the same things over and over. We're sacrificing, but we need God. Uh, it's important that we don't become discouraged and give up because God's power is there. Philippians 4 verse 3 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Christ does strengthen us. He helps us. He's a huge motivator for us. But he's there for us. Thankfully, um, he not only died for us, but he was resurrected. He, he's at the right hand of God and lives in us through the, the Spirit. And for those who are not baptized, he works with you to help you grow and help you change and learn and to draw you to the place where you ultimately want to be baptized and have that spirit living in you as well. Let's go back to Ephesians. Let's conclude over in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. I'll just read part of this and emphasize what it says in, in verse 10. Ephesians 6 Verse 10 and 11, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. We can be, try to be strong in ourselves, but that's not going to be enough. We need to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And it goes on to say, put on the whole armor of God. It's God's armor. It belongs to Him. He gives us that. He gives us these things. And I won't go through all the specifics here. Uh, save that for another time. But we can have the power of His might. We can have the armor of God. And so we need his help. We need his, his power to overcome. And so ask for that. Ask God to empower us. Don't just leave it aside. Don't just ignore. But when we come at Passover, we are renewing the covenant that we made at baptism. And we are dedicating ourselves uh, to live his way. And we're reminded that he paid the penalty of our sins, that he died for us, that God loves us so deeply. 
there's a, there's a, there's a sense of guilt of our sin, but there's also the blessing of knowing that he forgives us completely when we truly repent before him. So we have a, we have a part in this process. Um, I, I put down here the three R's. Recognize our sin. Recognize our sin. Repent by acknowledging our sin to God. And then reform. Reform. Reform ourselves into something that is more like God. And recognize that it's actually God reforming us. It's interesting. I read recently when David speaks of created me a clean heart. That word create doesn't mean to, you know, to reshape what's there. It doesn't mean to kind of remodel it. It means to create new. And that's what God is doing. He's giving us a new heart. He's not just fixing little things here and there. He wants to give us something brand new. And we are growing toward that when we repent and change. So recognize our sin, repent of our sin, and reform. Change our ways. Learn to do things differently. There are, unfortunately, no machines to examine our spiritual condition. We do so with God's word, with his help to truly see ourselves as we are, acknowledging, repenting, and changing. If you're unbaptized, self-examination this time of year can be an important tool toward your spiritual improvement and eventually draws you toward baptism. But for those of us who are baptized, let us take time to truly examine ourselves so that we draw closer to God grow in spiritual maturity, and partake of the Passover in a worthy manner.